но здесь еще у нас есть перевод, поэтому все поймете. Сегодня у нас конференция идет в онлайн-трансляции, поэтому, пожалуйста, не ходите перед камерой по возможности, которая стоит вот там в углу. Пожалуйста, проходите вот с этой стороны. И еще, может быть, несколько, несколько организационных моментов. Каждый доклад 15 минут, и у нас обсуждение будет после панельной секции, где-то после трех-четырех докладов. Еще один вопрос для всех компенсационных документов, билетов, командировочных. Пожалуйста, можете обращаться с этим к моей коллеге Лю, Юлии Лебедевой, я не знаю, она должна быть здесь где-то, или вот Елена Мосман, вы ее можете видеть вот там сзади. И лучше сегодня эти вопросы решить. Здесь вы можете использовать сеть Wi-Fi, если у вас ноутбуки, компьютер с собой, вам нужно выбрать сеть. Вот вы видите на экране пароль. Также вы найдете информацию об участниках на этом веб-сайте. Там размещен блок конференции. У вас есть программа конференции, и вы можете кликать на э, имена участников, чтобы прочитать короткую аннотацию, биографию и список публикаций каждого докладчика. Итак, мы очень рады начать нашу конференцию по теме «Идеалы воспитания дворянства в Европе». И сейчас я хочу передать слово директору немецкого исторического института в Москве, профессору Николаю Сукацеву. Добро пожаловать на нашу конференцию. Мне очень приятно приветствовать всех вас здесь, в Москве, в нашем институте, в столице России. И команда Немецкого исторического института очень рада пригласить вас на эту конференцию и обсуждать с вами этот очень важный предмет. Как вы уже знаете, Немецкий исторический институт – это независимый исследовательский институт и является прямым представительством фонда Макса Вебера. Он проводит исследования по российской истории в европейской перспективе и, общает, и соединяет мировую историографию и европейскую историографию с российским аспектом. Он развивает сотрудничество между немецкими и российскими историками, организует встречи между коллегами из разных стран. Проекты исторического института акцентируются на международном контексте российской истории с XVI до XX века. Мне кажется, что эта конференция является очень хорошим примером комбинации широкой транснациональной тематики и исторической ориентации, а также много... Я 
I've interpreted the research project on the history of uh, Russian nobility and European nobility, or rather on elite culture, which has interrupted the main aspects of cultural history, language, terms, semantics, exchange, transfer, adaptation, and variation of ideas and concepts, political and religious institutions and social practices, self-images, and various discourses. The exploration of the idea of education among the European or East European abilities seems to be an exploration of lower horizons. The papers presented here do not only take look from within the aristocracy and low mobility, the state as a collective, several families or institutions, or some individual private male female practices. They also will give us a lot of fresh new material for comparative analysis of educational strategies and standards, models and values, patterns and categories, behavior and representation. The examples which will be discussed here are taken from diverse contexts, regions, and traditions. They have in common the transnational orientation and new sources as the starting point. I know that many of you have traveled from quite a distance to participate uh, at this uh, conference. To all mm -hmm. von der Max Weber ist Bonn. Kische Schifferdecker und Charlotte Jans. Большое спасибо, что вы приехали. Ну и последнее, но не менее важное.
let's start now. And thank you from my own to the German Institute for organizing this very interesting conference, I think. So uh, we have a bit of time, and I'm going to introduce uh, Jean Boutier. Uh, he is a professor, director of études in the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales and director of the Center Norbert Elias in Marseille. Uh, his field of research is, uh, I could say, the first uh, Italian uh, nobility. Uh, his dissertation was about nobility in Florence in modern time. And then, uh, now, uh, comparative studies of nobility, especially with the approach of uh, cultural and social history, uh, a study of cultural practices. Uh, he has a lot of publications, for instance, Rome, Naples, Florence, Histoire comparée des milieux intellectuels du 17e et 18e siècle, that is a, a comparative history of the intellectual networks in modern times in, the, in Italy, uh, La politique par correspondance, uh, politics and correspondence uh, in the same period, and uh, some publication uh, of maps and atlases, very important historical atlases. So, uh, Jean, if you can come. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to uh, begin by thanking the uh, German Historical Institute in Moscow for hosting this conference. Oh, sorry, there's no sound, so that's bad. In particular, my colleagues Vladislav uh, Bielski uh, and Vladimir Belovich for inviting me to present this inaugural lecture. Uh, I'm an historian, as Vladimir uh, said, of Western Europe, accustomed to looking at the continent from an, an Atlantic or Mediterranean perspective. And I'm sure that this first trip to Moscow will help me shift my approaches to the questions concerning the European mobilities, which is my main research field since many years. I do think that my major contribution to our debate will be my knowledge about mobilities of Western Europe, even if I have always refused to shelter behind hermetic frontiers, which did not really exist in our European Europe. In any case, the historian working on the institutions of Western European mobilities since the 16th century onwards, the historian does not cease to encounter noble travels from Eastern and Northern Europe who devoted several years of their life in discovering the world, that means the design of Europe. Let me begin with Italy, it won't be a surprise. 28th January 1563, Vicenza, in Northern Italy, one of the seven cities, noble cities, of the Venetian state. It's not the main one. But a town of middling size and population behind Brescia, Padua, and Verona, well known cities, bred of small ones like Bergamo or Crema. In the census of 1557, it counted about 20,000 inhabitants. But a little more of 150,000 <coughs> for its whole territory. <coughs> it's a, a regional center without any significant international trade. A dozen gentlemen have gathered in the family palace of Nicola Tieni, a member of an ancient family of knights <coughs> who, reached, who reached the summits of urban power only in the 16th century. These gentlemen have recently created, I quote, an Academy for Riding and Fencing. 
in Latin, Academia Equitatus et Arborum, which they want to register and officialize by a notary act. This company of gentlemen, as they call themselves, is a private institution, totally financed by its members, whose purposes and expectations are very clearly exposed at the beginning of the contract, I quote. As these above gentlemen are well aware how useful, convenient, and honorable <coughs> it is for gentlemen to know how to ride well and to use weapons, since the exercise of horsemanship occupies the first place among all others. And a gentleman, in time of war as well as peace, is used to ride and hold a sword on his side. The first step of the decision is clear, is clear the identification of what constitutes both a daily tool and a status symbol of the northern man, namely a horse and a sword. At first glance, nothing very new. But in fact, this assertion reflected an important shift which occurred, I think, during the 16th century, a kind of aestheticization of the violence of the warrior, from riding to equestrian arts, from swordsmanship to fencing. The second element is more clearly a really new statement. Nobles are not naturally by birth. Good riders and warriors, I quote. And this is a very interesting piece of the act. In no profession or art was one ever born a master, as it is commonly stated, but everything has to be learned by exercising with persons who know how to teach and exercise. Their conclusion is logical. They have to hire and pay a master of equestrian art and a master of fencing. They then follow 11 articles which constitute the official rules of the Company of Gentlemen, established for three years and directed by the Prince, with two councillors, all elected, in a way, every four months. This quite exceptional document is perhaps one of the first pieces of evidence at the European level of the creation of an Academy of Education for Numbers. At first glance, the institution appears somewhat simple, created for a limited period. It's definitely not permanent. It is subsidized by its founders and not by any public institution such as cities, regional states, princes, or states. But two elements are central and set it apart. Two disciplines, two arts, are essential to make novels the equestrian arts and the art of fencing. The total mastery of these arts does not come naturally but must be acquired and then mastered through learning. This is a significant turning point, I think, in the social history of Italian nobilities, <coughs> even more, as I will try to argue today, European nobilities. In fact, this creation of an academy, this is the word used in the Notary Act, could be analyzed as a local micro event implying a small group of people living in the city without any intervention from outside. Vicenza, always on the map, this is the main square of Vicenza, too. you should see the landscape. Uh, Vicenza was a part of the Venetian saints since the beginning of the 16th, 15th century and controlled its rural surroundings, its contado. All families participating in its creation were well-known families, Thiel, Barbarano, Francazzano, etc., belonging to an ancient aristocracy, often with feudal rules. Many of their ancestors were soldiers involved in, in the Italian wars, and all had been active since decades in the government of the city. The birth of this new educational institution could thus be analyzed purely at a local level as a means of maintaining a traditional culture based on a sense of aristocratic honor against the rising power of new families, using the juridical professions, 
the juridical profession has the path of affirming their more effective skills and capacities in holding political positions in the city government. This could lead, lead to a micro civil investigation about many issues involved in this apparently small case. Values, I mean honor, civility, autumn in Latin, and leisure, but also power, social agenda. I want to choose to analyze this event in another way. To consider this agreement between 12 gentlemen from Vicenza, helped along by a local natural family as the sign of a major turning point in the history of European aristocracies. A turning point that perhaps appears to me quite paradoxical if we consider the middle of the 16th century, and I think this is an important point, as a key period of what was called then the military revolution, which transformed the manner of waging war all over Europe. During the 16th century, the ancient medieval knights were replaced by the infantry, and firearms of all kinds transformed blade weapons into obsolete military tools. From this point of view, we cannot consider these academies or nobles as a simple kind of professional school, but as the result of process. I quote an important study by John Hale on the military education in early modern Europe, quote, whereby notion of institutionalized military education began to erode that of the well-born individual's right to command on the basis of birth and familiarity with horse and sword. As opposed to the colleges of the Catholic Counter-Reformation or the universities, academies for novels are, <coughs> from an historiographical point of view, quite a neglected topics. Certain lists of important works exist, such as Bridges' one on the seminary and really in Italy, or Nova Conrad's study of the Peter Academy, or Mark Motley's book about the education of the French culture, or those of younger historians like Ivo Serman for Central Europe, or Andrea Druski for France, both of them present in this conference. But we need a more global approach to analyze the education of European elites as a whole. And this is what we're expecting, I think, from this conference. Today, I will consider the larger transformation affecting, affecting the entire ensemble of educational institutions. I would like to focus on the specific changes concerning the nobility. And let's come back to these academies for nobles. What happened in Vicenza was not a single isolated event. In the three several association or academies during the same years, 1550s, 1580s, <coughs> and transport to propose trainings and lectures to provide an adequate education to young gentlemen in Bologna as early in, as 1555, maybe a new erected Academia degli Ardenti seems to have been the first to offer a quote, nightly exercises to young lovers. In Pavia, not far from Milan, at the beginning of the 1570s, the Congregazione di Cavalieri del Sol, Congregation of Knights of the Sun, employed two masters for riding and fencing. And I could quote several, uh, one exa example, one which are not very well documented. Uh, and I am certain that further research in local archives would reveal many other cases and in which this picture is more detailed on the effective reality of these academies. Furthermore, this preoccupation was not strictly limited to Italy, but, and this is the second important element, was more widely taken into account by the European nobilities. Let us have a rapid look at some examples which reveal the existence of a larger public debate that has been deeply ex examined in France, in France by Andrea Bruschi in forthcoming book, important book be published in Italian next year. In England, around 1570, with the support of William Cecil, Lord Burley, one of the main secretaries of Elizabeth I, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who had been governor of Alger and recently elected member of the parliament, presented a project for, I quote the title, 
the election of an academy in London for the education, education of Her Majesty's Wars and others, the youth of nobility and gentlemen. The project was very ambitious and combined the main humanist disciplines of ancient languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, philosophy, natural, political, mathematics, cosmography, and astronomy, physics, and chemistry, and learning. The modern languages to be taught were French, Italian, Spanish, and High Dutch. Writing, fencing, dancing, and playing musical instruments was were the other necessary elements for educating young noblemen in a school which had to be called Queen Elizabeth's Academy. In France, a little later, a Protestant noble, Francois de Lannoy, whose family and military traditions going back to the 12th century and was one of the most loyal members of the Calvinist army during the French Civil Wars, wrote during his confinement in the early 1580s his Discours Politiques et Militaires, Political and Military Discourses. His main concern in these discourses was the, the education of young noble noble depe, not translated in English, for whom he proposed the creation of four academies that could be opened in some of the major city of the kingdom. You can see a geography of this proposal. Paris, Lyon in the Rhone Valley, Eastern France, Bordeaux on the Atlantic coast, and Angers in the Loire Valley. Or, other solution, in the main royal castles near these capitals, Fontainebleau near Paris, Moulin in the center of France, Pessinet near Angers, uh, and Cognac, the birthplace of Francis I near Bordeaux. The book itself had a strong impact, not only in France, but also in Germany, where a German translation by Richard Frankfurt in 1592, that means five years later, uh, after the French edition, was widely read and influenced several projects at the beginning of the 17th century, as Robert Conrad's has clearly demonstrated in his book on the German academies. This is enough, I suppose, to show both the profound transformation of the nobility's attitude toward education, the change effectively analyzed, but in a little different approach by John Hexter for England, France, and the Netherlands in a similar paper, a very famous one published in 1950, and the invention of a new kind of educational institution, institution for the nobility. This first point is very well illustrated and very well known, I think. Uh, illustrated by the famous letter <coughs> sent by the giant Gargantua to his young son, Pantagruel. It's the first book by Rabelais published in 1532. Living, Pantagruel living and studying in Paris, in which Rabelais exposed a very long kind of encyclopedic program of education according to the requirements of European humanism. The principle is very simple, but quite inaccessible. The necessity for the prince both to master all the knowledges humanism has made available and obviously to excel in each subject too. Considering that the letter was sent from, I quote, Utopia on a certain 17th of March. It can be read as a real pedagogical project, which on the country is presented informally, though in all its complexity, in another book published a little earlier, 1528, in Venice, Il libro del Cortegiano, translated into English by the Courtier by Baldassare Castiglio. The book is not, in fact, a treatise on noble education, but a long discussion between noblemen and noble women on the ideal of a perfect culture. In contrast to humanism, without ever ignoring it, Castiglio defended a subtle combined, subtle combined apprenticeship of both arms 
10 letters. I don't have time to develop this point, which is quite well known in Sigurds. The diffusion of the book, first in Italian, this is the first edition, on the, uh, the image, then in different languages, as a copy of the English translation by Sir Thomas Hobby, 1561, or uh, another edition, which is not the first one, in Lyon, in French, in uh, 1588. Uh, the diffusion of the book in the main languages of Western Europe played an effective role in altering attitude of the nobility towards education. <coughs> uh, 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 small figure according to uh, more recent data we have about this publication, there's another one which was published, which is not really a translation, which was published in Krakow. Uh, and which is a kind of adaptation of the uh, culture uh, in a, a, a Polish settlement. So the diffusion, and I think this is a, a point which could be discussed, uh, the diffusion of the culture corresponded more or less to the period of invention and early diffusion <coughs> of academies <coughs> or novels. We still know very little about these first academies. In France, it's certain that they were active in Paris, the famous Academy of Monsieur de Privilel, since spring 1594, but also in the principal cities of the kingdom, Rouen, Orléans, show the same map, which is not exactly the same one, but which gives you, anyway, Tours, Saumur, Angers, which are three cities in the Loire Valley, Toulouse in the south, and, and a little north of Bordeaux on the Atlantic side, Brouage, which is a small harbor, uh, a little later in Aix-en-Provence, on the other Mediterranean Sea, uh, in Bordeaux, or in Rennes in Great Britain. This early network was evoked and admired by uh, the Venetian ambassador at the French court in the years 1595. 1597, and uh, immediately imitated by him after his return to Venice. And there was initiative in his, in his capacity of captain of Padua. Several academies for novels were created in the main cities of the state of Venice in the years 1605 1612, sustained this time, like in France, by a strong financial support. In Germany, after some failed attempts in sales on Eidenberg, the first Ritter Schule, called the Collegium Illustre, opened in Tübingen in 1594, same year as in Paris. It was a non trite su success with about 450 for the years uh, 1594, uh, 7, 1727, so. sorry. Uh, 1637, sorry. It was immediately followed in Castle by the Collegium Mauritianum, but in contrast to the French institution, the word Ritter Academy was not used, I suppose, till the project of the Ritter Academy in Gießen in 1655. If a similar institution opened rapidly in Denmark, in Seoul, under the name of Collegium Liga at the Liga Academy in 1633, we have to wait till the beginning of the 1680s after several failed projects for the founding of a similar institution in England, when a Parisian Huguenot writing master, Salomon Foubert, exiled from Paris because of his religious faith, faith opened his academy in Piccadilly, in London, which was rapidly recognized as royal and continued to function until the 1760s. A precise and lengthy description of what is an early academy for novels has been left by the Swiss traveler Thomas Platter in the account of his travels to France during the years 1595 1599. I quote In Rouage, a small city on the Atlantic coast, western France, there is a special academy, according to the term used by the French. His year training and teaching is provided, is provided to young noblemen and other well known lords in all kinds of exercises and equestrian games. They are taught horse riding, vaulting, dancing, 
fencing, playing the lute, and similar activities. And the students are accompanied by a rector, paid by the French king as well by the students. For these extreme exercises, the rector maintained the best riding masters, fencing and dance masters. Splendid indeed is his table in which he houses some dozens of horses, each more magnificent than the other. In parallel, the students learn to straddle their mounds, run at the ring, then they follow the fencing class, then comes bolting on wooden horses. From there, they move on to dancing, which they apply themselves with as much zeal. Soon after the meal, they learn to measure, to trace the foundation of the fort on the soil or to fortify it. And then they play music. Two years is generally the period of education in these academies, sometimes more, sometimes less. The students are mostly between 14 and 20. It's rare that they are younger or older. The young noble need no longer go to Italy to train himself. He enters the army to engage in war or enters the service, the service of the great lord. Thus, a gentleman is considered worthless and useless if he has not been trained in all the disciplines I've just indicated. Sorry, the, the, the quotation was a little long, but I think it's the first real description of what was the love of the life in a novel, a from novel. A small booklet from the beginning of the 17th century, a very rare booklet, but I think now very well-known images, illustrates through a series of engravings the activities followed by the young novel in the Collegium Music in Tübingen, created some years later by the Duke of Württemberg, installed near the university. This is the main point of the German space. The young novels, as you can see on the image on the right, on the right side, dukes, uh, counts, barons, and children of the nobility could participate in the classes proposed by the university. This is first image, benefit from the numerous books available in its library, whilst, whilst practicing the military exercises and the variety of techniques available with bladed weapons and play at ball and court in France, the Jeu de Paul. <coughs> the two examples of Brouage and Tubing <coughs> demonstrate some tensions between different models of education. Observing Gouage, the Swiss Thomas Platter would affirm that the French, I quote, claim that whoever talks in Latin can only be a priest. This position that radically opposed the intellectual training of arts and natures in particular to the physical and military training can be found, for example, in the later proceedings of the estates of Languedoc, the estates of Southern France in 1663, which distinguished very clearly the colleges and what for training those who follow the arts and later from the academy for, for noble, I quote, the only institutions the institution in the province for noble men training in arms. This can maybe suggest that the academy functioned as a finishing school where the young gentleman went after several years spent in college to acquire the capacities to become a warrior the culture of the servant of the prince. But it also can be understood as a critique of the humanist education that gave importance to the multiple knowledges indispensable to the only as we say in French from the 17th century onwards. On the other end, the Collegium Illustre of Tübingen and many, most of the <coughs> German Britain Academy highlights the proximity of the College of Nobles to the University. The College completed the training that still rested partly on some form of university knowledge like law and philosophy. These two examples suggest clearly that the Nobel Academy were far from constituting a unique and uniform model. One can distinguish at least three broad groups. The first one contains institutions of small size where education was largely focused the equestrian arts and military discipline. These are 
this for example the example of Cuban with Vicenza. This can be found in Italy and France in the 1550s to the 1720s. Second model, this oh, just comment, these parallel initiatives were probably, probably planned, and I think it's a point to be discussed, to counter the first colleges established by the religious orders of the Catholic reform, such as the Jesuits, who opened in Europe, the first college in Italy in 1547. In France, the same Jesuit began a little later, 10 years later, and gained an important advantage with the opening of the College of Clermont in Paris, which became in the 17th century the College of Ville de Rome, according to the name of the uh, Sanke. Other religious order, like the Oratorians, the Barnabites, or the Somascan Fathers, mutated the Jesuits some decade, some decade uh, later. The latter, anxious to ensure their own control of the ruling class, proposed to integrate, and this is, I think, the second order, the disciplines most sought after by the nobility in their own colleges. After two experiences in Coimbra, Portugal, and in Praga, in Bohemia, before 1555, the Jesuits opened their first Seminarium Nobilium, Seminaries for Romans, in Milan in 1574, and created a very dense network in northern and central Italy with about 15 colleges for nobles in Bologna, uh, 1588, and so on. I don't quote the, the, the cities. The model would be taken up by Jesuits in Spain in the 17th century, later in Austria or in Poland during the 17th and 18th century. The model was maybe more rare in France, but it gave rise to some major creations, such, and this is the image, as the Jesuit College in La Flèche, near Le Mans, which served as a hothouse of upper aristocracy. It's quite famous because it was created by Henry IV. You see his uh, uh, statue, or his portrait uh, on the door. And uh, the philosopher Descartes was one of his most famous students. Or another boarding school in Juilly, not far from Paris, opened by not the uh, Jesuits, but the Oratorians in uh, 1639, which still exists. Whatever the role of others, other religious orders, the Jesuits can be considered, and I think this is a very important point, as the main actors in the diffusion of the colleges reserved to the nobility in Catholic Germany. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, distinguish a third model, which is quite different. From the 1620s onwards, following several projects and attempts, amongst which the most well-known were those introduced by the Cardinal Richelieu, and later by the Cardinal Mazarin, Richelieu in the 1520s, 1530s. The academies of equestrian arts, arts transformed themselves into two colleges for nobles, proposing teaching covering a broad range of subjects in different disciplines. Teaching was nonetheless quite opposed to that proposed by the humanist culture, which was this humanist culture grounded on the mastery of ancient languages and the knowledge of literature as produced. The academies for nobles proposed a set of teachings coherently organized around the arts of government. Law, in its diverse forms, <coughs> history, eloquence, foreign languages, mainly according to the academy and notes, Italian, German, Spanish, French, depending on the country, geography, considered as, since Giovanni Botteo, the political knowledge of states and societies of Europe and of the world. Practical mathematics gave novels the means to use artillery to lead sieges and to plan important military campaigns. <clears throat> Eventually, more specialized natures could provide additional knowledge of heraldry and astronomy. In the 18th century, with the arrivals arrival of schools of engineers, some academies started holding classes in physics and chemistry. In Paris, if Paris, all along the 17th century and a good part of the 18th century remained the city by excellence of aristocratic exercises, <coughs> counting up 
up to eight academies in the 1660s. The academies founded in the capital of small states also affirmed themselves as major European references since the, the second half of the 17th century. These are the main ones in, created in Brussels in 1671, in Turin in 1679, in Wolfenbüttel. In 1687, in Florence in 1689, in Nancy in 1699, I call the main ones, they became, they rapidly became points of convergence where young aristocrats from all over Europe could receive the indispensable teachings and initiate themselves as at the same time in courtly etiquette and his behavior by attending, I think this was the main point, by attending the court of the prince or founding the academy. Indeed, it's well known, for example, in Nancy or in Turin, the prince easily welcomed the young nobles to the festivities held at his court or even to his table some evenings of the week, something which was quite impossible in the principal court of Europe, like Versailles. According to Lord Chesterfield, in his famous letter sent to his son during the, his grand tour in 1746-51, the Academy of Turin has become the best place in Europe for the education of young aristocrats. Despite opening up their portals to a wide range of disciplines, the Academy is strongly different from the colleges of Catholic Europe or from the University of the German world. The model of teaching they proposed beyond this university I have shown presents some principal features. 